JetBlue's unusual security question, the deeper meaning behind hello in Ojibwe, and for our main course, anthropologist Alexis Bunton tells us how to travel to Native American sites respectfully. Welcome back to Travel Tomorrow, the podcast about what's new and what's next in travel. I'm Alicia Underly Nelson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Joe Bauer, in Berlin. How's it going, Alicia? I haven't been just talking to you before we started recording. It's going well. My mind is occupied with uh, stories for December and setting up for a Christmas market. So as we are working on this fabulously engaging podcast, one tiny part of my brain is pondering a rug for a studio space, which is really strange and not where my energy normally is. What kind of rug are you going to go with? Uh, whatever rug I can get for free is what I'm going to go with because it's a brand Those new are good studio rugs. space. It's it's very cool, but it's like all plywood, and like I, I don't think I can afford to be picky because the market starts tonight at six. So, um, whatever I can find will work. And now that we've lured in our audience with an engaging conversation about the hypothetical rug you might get, fascinating. <laughs> Let's talk about something much more interesting than a rug. Joe, you have our first stop. I do. Now boarding. We're all familiar with online security questions. You sign onto your account for Amazon or whatever from a different computer, and they ask you to verify that you are who you say you are by answering questions only you'd know the answer to. What street did you grow up on? Where you were born? Your favorite pizza topping? That kind of thing. Well, JetBlue was asking, what is the name of your favorite child? A screenshot was passed around on Twitter showing the security question, to which JetBlue responded with a retweet that read, say it, you know you have one. That is really the best response. That's probably the only response. It's a little creepy, though, that they want to know who your favorite child is, as if they're thinking, like, I, I go to, because this is a budget airline, I go immediately to the to the macabre that they want to know who your favorite child is so they can just make your life a little bit worse. But okay, what's well, good to know that's your favorite child in case you ever displease us. <laughs> that is really sinister. I don't think Jeb Blue put that much thought into it. I think the early, the, the shorter days in Berlin are starting to get to me. So yeah, my mind went dark immediately. Like the like our the shortness of our days, early early darkness, and my brain just goes straight to darkness. And they wanted Jet Blue. That's what I'm. That's what I've come to the conclusion of. Jet Blue wants to know the name of your favorite child, so that they know they know who to pluck away if they need to. <laughs> so they can wreck your life and take the life of your favorite offspring. I didn't say take wow. the life. Those are those are your words. Those are Alicia Underly Nelson's words that they want to actually commit murder. I'm just saying that they might have something mischievous in mind, but you, you're the one who made that very disturbing leap right there, if I may say. I think what JetBlue had in mind is just being mischievous enough to get this uh, retweeted, which is exactly what happened, and it played out very well. And uh, let's be real. I think most all, most parents say they don't have a favorite child, but I'm pretty sure that they do. And I'm pretty sure that in my family, it's my brother. Really? You're going to shortchange yourself like that? Oh, for sure. My my parents have insisted always that they love us all equally, and they, they think it's really damaging if parents play favorites. But then the, the pretty much universal follow-up to that is, well, it's just your brother was so easy. And my sister and I are like, mm-hmm, yep, we know what that means. Well, I haven't met your brother or your sister, but I'm sure your parents were right. I don't know. <laughs> I've met my brother. He he probably was the easiest one of all of us. So, so are you the favorite, or is your brother the favorite? Oh, I don't. I don't. I think I think there might legitimately be disinterest from my parents to to have ever made a decision on that count. But they were definitely the ones to always say like, "Oh, we don't have a favorite." I'm. I think they probably had a favorite, just depending on the day. I probably had more days where I was not the favorite. And that's also mathematically true. I am four, almost four and a half years younger than my brother, so he's got more favorite days on me. Hmm. You were playing the favorite baby of the family card. I have that going for me, which is nice. Now boarding. November is Native American Heritage Month and also Thanksgiving, which is the source of so many really problematic narratives about Native Americans. So because of that, we thought it was appropriate to talk about how Native American cultural tourism is filling in the gaps in that narrative and how we can travel to indigenous historic and cultural sites respectfully. So with all that in mind, I spoke to Alexis Celeste Bunton, who is an anthropologist, manager, applied researcher, and consultant 
who has written extensively about global indigenous tourism for more than 20 years. She is the co-director of Bioneers, and the nonprofit's native-led indigeneity program promotes the knowledge and culture of indigenous people. And Alexis is of native Alaskan descent herself, so while she was working on her doctorate, she worked as a tour guide for Tribal Tours, a nonprofit owned by the Sitka Tribe of Alaska. And that practical experience, combined with her academic work, led to a book called So, How Long Have You Been Native? Life as an Alaska Native Tour Guide. So I started our interview by asking her about that particular experience and how she came up with the title of her book. And the title is, So How Long Have You Been Native? That, that was a question that a number of us who were Native Alaskan tour guides working for tribal tours in Sitka, Alaska, we got asked that at least once or twice at tour season. And many other funny questions. What were some of the other ones? Um, let's see. Um, do you use American money? We were in Alaska. Um, how did you learn to speak such good English? Is another common one. Uh, once a friend of mine who is a totem pole carver said that somebody asked him how they grow the trees to be carved like that from the ground. Uh, another favorite wow. is, um, what's the altitude? We, these were for people who came via cruise ship <laughs> and landed on a beach. <laughs> they wanted to know the altitude. So were these primarily American travelers, European travelers? I mean, wh- yeah, was pre- there any theme? Predominantly American. Oh, that's disheartening. <laughs> From all over the country. Yeah. <laughs> we were in a temperate rainforest. <laughs> wow. So, like, clearly they had not done a lot of research before no. they got off the ship. Okay. That that can happen. That's a, a problem with having your days arranged for you. So how, how do you handle that as a guide in the moment? Um, usually we're just pretty nice about it. We were and just answer the question patiently. Um, occasionally, sometimes... If somebody had been asked one too many stupid tourist questions, they might say some, give a sarcastic answer, but it's hospitality and people are well-trained. So we usually just with patience. Well, you talked about the tourist gaze in your book. Can you define that for us? Yeah. Um, so the tourist gaze is a, a scholarly concept that was first coined by a academic named John Uri. And the tourist gaze refers to that when people go on vacation and they consume people, places, cultures, that they're consuming what they want to see, what's in their head of what they're seeing and not what actually is what they're seeing and experiencing. So there's a lot of ideas and discussions out there about how this tourist gaze actually reshapes local culture to fit that imagine idea of the place and people being consumed. So what do we miss when experiences cater to that tourist gaze? Authenticity, which is, I think, what people are actually seeking when, especially if they want to do cultural tourism of any kind. So you have a really extensive academic background on this subject. Um, we talked a little bit about your experiences kind of on the ground in a practical sense as a guide. Was Were there other lessons other than um, how frustrating and uninformed travelers can be that you learned when you were working with the public in this way? Yes. Um, I learned that I love people from North Carolina. They're, they were always my favorite. They're just, I would just really enjoy guests that I would have and I'd say, where are you from? And almost inevitably the ones that I just really liked were from North Carolina and it was a really uh, great experience to get to meet a lot of people from all over the country with lots of different backgrounds and with curiosity. It actually, I mean, you can speak negatively about the tourist gaze or uninformed questions or people's ignorance when they're traveling. But I think the it is by far overshadowed by people's curiosity and meeting people from all different walks of life. So how can people, when they're going to a new place, how can they be the opposite of the travelers that some of the travelers that you met? How can they gain a better understanding of the indigenous nations who call that place home before they go and when they're actually there? Well, of course, it's good if you have time to do your homework. It can be difficult to do that with 
Native American communities or indigenous nations around the world because they might not necessarily be a tourist guide or a history book or an anthropological ethnography written. And in those cases, what I usually do is do a little bit of Google searching about people I'm visiting, learn, learn the name of the names of the communities that live in the place that I'm visiting. Um, and even if you can't do any preliminary research, once you get to a place, it's better to ask questions and to listen than to make assumptions when you're meeting locals, I think. What are some questions that were helpful for you? What are some of your favorite questions that you were asked? That I was asked? Oh, I was, I'm, can I flip the question and think about the kind of questions I ask? when Yeah, I absolutely. Sure. <laughs> I was a tour guide working for a native owned tour company. And so people already self-selected themselves to be curious and they were on a tour learning about the history and culture uh, from an indigenous perspective. So those people kind of self-selected to listen before Q and A. And, um, but when I travel to new places, uh, especially Native communities, I, at first I like to ask people what they like, to, what they refer to themselves as. What's the name of their tribe? I often ask how to pronounce it properly, and people are usually really patient and will let me practice it ten times and keep fumbling it. And they really appreciate the effort of just learning how to say who they are in their language. One thing that's that can be helpful. I go to the Southwest a lot. If you go to uh, the park systems in the Southwest, a lot of them hire native interpreters and it's their job to share their culture and their history and their place. So usually you don't even have to do more than show up at the right place at the right time and say, hey, can you tell me about this place? Other good questions to ask. You know, it's kind of fun. It's a funny question for me because honestly, in those situations, it's you're usually not standing in a Q&A kind of that context. Usually you're being taught something and then afterwards you might have questions based on what you've heard. How can travelers be sure that their travel dollars are actually benefiting Native people and businesses instead of something run by non-Native people? Oh, that's a great question. I think that the answer to that question is to purchase art, souvenirs, clothing, food, directly from the people themselves. I like to buy things from artisans um, at local markets, on the side of the road, <laughs> and that could be food vendors as well, um, and get it directly from them. If you are going in a very highly mediated commercial looking gift shop, chances are the money is not, is leaving the hands of the local artisans, craftspersons, vendors, and so on. So let's say maybe somebody um, books online or they go with their gut instinct and they find that maybe they're um, guided by someone that isn't indigenous or they're getting um, maybe not the complete story of the place that they're visiting or the people that they're learning about. How does the average traveler fact check a historical attraction or an event while they're there? Can I go back to the last question and then come to this one? Absolutely, sure. Uh, I also wanted to say that uh, museums, tribal museums and non-tribal museums, their gift shops are usually really good about um, getting money back in the hand of local artisans and also ensuring that the things that you buy are authentically made by Native artists. That's great. That's exactly the kind of practical thing that we want people to know. So that's wonderful. Okay, so how can you fact check? Yeah, maybe you show up and you think, wait a minute, that's not entirely accurate. Um, hmm. Like, wh Where do you start in that moment? There is an organization called IANTA, the American in Indian Alaska Native Travel Association. Mm -hmm. And you can go to their website. It's IANTA.org, A-I-A-N-T-A dot org. And they have developed a resource, set of resources that, that anybody can go search to learn about who are the tribes and Native people across North America who are offering authentic tribally-led tours around the country. And that's where I would go if to find real tribally-led tours. They also have a, they made a map, and it is at a website called 
Native America Travel. And you can link to it through IANTA's website. And on that, there's an interactive map that you can search anywhere in the country and find Native American vendors, Native American tour guides, Native tribally led tour companies, foods. Um, so that is just a really, really good resource for people. And then let me just share with you as well, um, this Native America travel site that was put together by IANTA. Perfect. And it's just Native America, all one word, dot travel. And you can just go to that website and they have all kinds of cool experiences and things that you can do around the country that are real native led experiences. Speaking of, you know, native led experiences and places all around the country, um, many historic and spiritual sites are centered around natural structures, not anything human built, or if there are human built structures, that's not entirely the point. And that kind of challenges what many people think of as tourism. So what opportunities and challenges does this present when you're encouraging people to visit? Well, I kind of think about it from a different perspective, because when I think about natural sites as a place to go visit that connects you to a cultural landscape, that's what we call it, I think of things like mountains that have stories embedded in them that you wouldn't know unless you were with a local guide wouldn't know how cultural the site is. I also think about things like rock art and petroglyphs, mm -hmm. which I love to go visit. And a lot of times if I'm somewhere new, I'll do a little bit of research and look to see if there are any trails or places where I can see those natural sites. But to me, the obstacle is not so much to the traveler, but to the protection of those sites, often which are sacred sites because occasionally there are people who um, find out about these places uh, will deface them in an act of mm -hmm. racism. So that's an obstacle to it. And another obstacle to it is um, a lot of sacred sites to Native people are also um, favored favorite recreation sites and recreation that's done like, say, uh, off-roading in the Mojave Desert. There's a lot of sacred sites there, but the off-roading destroys it. In northwest Wyoming, there is a place called Devil's Tower, and there was a big controversy over it because it is a sacred site to a lot of the tribes in that area, but recreational rock climbers like to rock climb it, and it's very famous. So oftentimes there can be a clash between um, honoring and revering sacred sites for what they are. So for example, you wouldn't go scale the Notre Dame, you know, exactly. and, and recreational outdoors people wanting to enjoy it. There's also been a lot of controversies around um, the building of ski resorts, actually, on mountains that are considered sacred to tribal peoples who live around them. And I, there are examples of that um, in, the U, in the American West, in British Columbia, where tribes have severely protested the building of new ski resorts. So there is that clash, and we just have to work our way through it as a society. So how do you think we do work our way through it? How do we get more traditional business and outdoors interests to, to hear those spiritual concerns? I think the recreationalists should just honor it and go somewhere else. <laughs> I think it's a matter of um, education and moving society along to be more inclusive and respectful of Native American religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs. Um, like I said, you wouldn't go, you wouldn't go climb the side of the Vatican or the Notre Dame. People would automatically realize that that's disrespectful, and actually not not respecting tribes. Um, religious beliefs to protect their sacred sites is actually a form of discrimination. Yeah, because absolutely. if you don't honor it, then it means it doesn't matter. It means that their beliefs are lesser than. And we do have a long way to go with educating people on what those practices are. And I, I think that's just something that everybody can make a point to be more aware of. Yeah, and I think we're moving in that direction as a society. And here again is a great here is a great opportunity for tourism, for tourism to tribes and invite people in to come visit them. For Americans who aren't 
indigenous to learn about these beliefs and come together, make friends with each other, humanize each other. And I think tourism is just a really, really great catalyst to do that. Um, I think a lot of people are intimidated by native people. They don't, they've never met a native person in their life. Um, there's a lot of negative stereotypes out there about native American people. And, um, but if you just go, you'll find that you'll be welcomed probably warmly. You know, if you go to an established tour site, meet a tour guide, meet a local artist and you really make friends and it'll be a rich and rewarding experience. So much of indigenous art and storytelling and culture history is passed down in ways that are really different from the dominant culture. So in what ways does this op open up some opportunities and challenges for cultural travel? I'm going to I think I mentioned... That. I that was really backwards. Go ahead. I gotcha. I gotcha. I think I mentioned one of the challenges before when you asked a question about how to, how to find these places or what mm -hmm. you should, how you should do your homework before you go visit. And I said, you know, in many cases, you can't really find a guidebook or you can't find a book that tells you about the history um, or the cultures of the people you're visiting. And that's because, um, A, we have an erasure of indigenous peoples in America, which is a part of genocide and colonization. But B, because, like you said in the question, that histories and cultures are uh, passed down orally, oftentimes, instead of written. So one tangible example of that is I had never really been to the Navajo Reservation before three years ago. And before I went, I tried to... Google a few things, um, key terms, um, a little bit about the culture. And this is second largest tribe in America, and I couldn't find anything. But after I went and met with some Navajo people and just hung out and spent time with artists and business people, I came, and storytellers, I came to learn a lot about the culture that I wouldn't have been able to find. So the challenge is, um, is that homework in the beginning and and that you may not be able to really learn anything until you get there but you just have to follow your gut and dive in and go those are the travel experiences that i like the best and that's really what we want to push on the show too is that immersive travel where you you show up and listen more than you talk yes exactly and that leads me to my last question which are what are some simple ways that we all can be better travelers one thing i take into consideration when I'm traveling is how I am going to dress and appear to the locals. I don't want to pull off a ugly American stereotype and the same can be true even for domestic travel in the U.S. So there are places like for example um, on the Hopi reservation traditionally it's considered um, not appropriate for women to show a lot of skin so maybe dress a little bit more conservatively if you're going to go there um, I would err on the conservative side regardless of where I go and um, see what the local people are like so that you don't make them feel uncomfortable by the way you're dressing or talking or taking up a lot of space um, find out for example um, in a lot of tribal communities, there are churches and religious structures and buildings. I will usually just ask a local, instead of just assuming that I can walk in, I will ask, is it okay to go in? What are the appropriate times? Because there may not be sign. And then, of course, um, there is a history of visitors to tribal villages and communities kind of just peering walking up to people's houses and peering in windows and just assuming is what I mean by taking up space wow. that they can just take pictures without asking permission or, or just look in people's windows. And again, that's related to that dehumanization. I was going to erase sure that I was talking about earlier. If you, if you consider a group of people lesser than you, then of course you would take up the privilege and the space to just walk right up. It, even in their front doors, <laughs> some that kidding. still happens. So some practical tips are, you know, ask before you enter. Don't take photos without permission. And if you have a doubt, just ask a question. And people really appreciate being asked questions better than just 
um, having assumptions. I really liked what she, like the, the idea of the tourist gaze runs through the book and a lot of her other writings. And I think that's such an important distinction to think about because she kind of defined it as when people are focused on consuming what they want to consume. And I think that word is like really vivid because it doesn't necessarily um, take into account the people or the place that's being consumed. It's really self-centered. So it's like all what we, what we want to see. Um, And I like how her work um, and a lot of what we talked about is focused on like seeing what's actually there instead of like imposing our own narrative on it. Yeah, and this tourist case thing, I I forgot that she had talked about that phrase. I think it's in the book as well. I think that's super applicable today when you, especially with Instagram, you see all these pictures of very, I don't know, I want to say very wealthy, but privileged people going around the world to lesser privileged places. And I always kind of question if they're actually, when they take a picture and they include locals in, in their content, if they're actually getting that authentic experience that Alexis talked about, or if they're just getting the experience that they wanted to get out of that destination, and that's what they're really sharing. And I do think it's really important that she talked about how people need to be sure that they're seeing the people that they're visiting as equals because there's some really rude behavior. I mean, even the questions that she was getting asked are asked from a place of, I mean, not just privilege, but I mean, kind of a sort of arrogance. And I think that that's something that everybody should try to check as much as possible. And I think that that maybe isn't something that, I mean, I like to think that we have listeners that are pretty self-aware, but I've seen that kind of behavior, um, I was at a site, it's right on the border of North Dakota and Montana. And I mean, there were some really ignorant comments that were being made to our Native American guy just about the way he was dressed and the words he was using. And he actually was very good about stopping and saying, you know what, that's not appropriate. But at the same time, like that is that is his job. But at the same time, I feel like other people on the tour could have also sa- also said something in that moment to make it a little less awkward for everybody. So I think if she gave us some really good tips for like being aware and making sure that people that we're with um, are also being self-aware and respectful. I don't know who you're talking about, and obviously I haven't met these people, but I kind of want to hit them over the head with a shovel. Yeah, it's really, I think so much of it, like... How do you, I, so were they, I, I'm just trying to get a better understanding of these people, were they on this tour uh, as paying customers, or was this like something they were forced into? I, yeah, it was at um, it was at a historic site, so it was kind of like it was a, a Native American culture day. So, so they like paid dancers. to like go on this tour and everything. They did, but I think a lot of it goes back to um, kind of what Alexis said: is a lot of times people haven't met anyone that's Native American because the the narrative that we get so much is um, we get the Thanksgiving narrative, which was pilgrims and Native Americans were friends and shared meals together, which is not at all didn't play out that way yeah it really did not um or we seem to hear that um the majority of native americans died or were killed and they're not really an active people anymore and for me that's really strange to hear because um i have cousins that are part native i have friends i grew up near a reservation in minnesota um i live fairly near to minneapolis where um, a lot of really important indigenous movements are coming from. So the idea that people haven't met someone that's native is strange to me because I'm used to having that perspective and culture. But I think if you grow up in a place where maybe you haven't, this this is your first time seeing someone that has this background. And if your only experience with them is like Western movies or what you learned in school, you're you're not going to have any idea of the richness and diversity of Native culture at all. And so I think your chances of saying something um, unintentionally stupid, really, they, they go up the less you know. Yeah, I definitely get that. I just don't know why. I, I always have the voice in my head telling me not to open my mouth if I feel at all uncertain about what I'm saying. And I'm sure I've said stupid stuff, but to the extent of insulting people, uh, minority people who have been just really oppressed throughout our history i i I just can't i don't understand how how certain thoughts get vocalized i suppose but that's my naivete my naivete i guess 
But clearly, I mean, clearly it happens because the questions that Alexis was saying that she and the guides got and even some of the questions I've overheard. I mean, if you're asking somebody how long they've been Native American, I mean, <laughs> or like it's really exciting that you speak English. I mean, clearly there's some real ignorance about um, what it means to be indigenous and the the sheer variety of perspectives that these nations have. I mean, I think we get that a lot too. People think there's like one or two groups of Native American people and that's not the case at all um, yeah so that, think, that question how long have you been native makes me think that wonder do people think that it's like a bar mitzvah like a native american bar mitzvah like you're 13 years old and congratulations you are now iroquois yeah i mean it seems possible but i think at least we're getting much better about asking better questions now and i think it helps to know that people do have those perspectives so that because i was stunned I, I looked at my brother and I, we just stared at each other like, is this person for real? Your brother, the and favorite like, child? I, yes, indeed. <laughs> As the favorite child, he should have stepped in. I mean, really. <laughs> Live up to the name, Jake. Come on. But yeah, I mean, I was I was stunned and I considered myself to be a pretty, um, I, I don't mind calling people out, but I just, I couldn't believe how, how ignorant the questions were. And I, I was just absolutely floored. So I think knowing that that wasn't an isolated incident, as depressing as that is, it at least puts me in a better headspace that when I'm visiting a Native American cultural site in the future, if I hear that kind of thing, like, I might be better equipped to help if I know it exists, that I'm not just reacting with shock. I mean, I can actually be useful. Speaking of being useful, Joe, how about you teach us a little bit of Ojibwe? Blah 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 blah. The Ojibwe Nation of the Northern United States and Canada have a word that roughly translates to the English "hi," and it's "anin." But what it literally means is "I see or acknowledge your light." Mm, that sounds very rich and deep. It does. I, like that. I know. I love it. It reminds me of like Namaste. It's like. That idea of not just greeting somebody, but like. But namaste is so overused these days. So many people have like now now I hear namaste and I don't hear the original meaning. I hear like somebody at the end of their yoga class be like, oh, thanks, everybody. That was a wonderful practice. Namaste. It's just been overused to me. Uh, so it's almost it's almost like a. I was just kind of picturing food for some reason, like high. The English high is like some crappy chicken fingers as an appetizer. Namaste is like the old popular dish that you know, like oh, okay, it's it's nice, but I'd like something new. Then you hear ani, like a waiter coming up. Would you like some hi? Would you like some namaste? Or would you like to try our new special ani? And it just sounds like mm, it's a beautiful word, good. isn't it? And it's so funny because I kind of come across it. Or I feel this the opposite way about it. Like this is a word I I live near Ojibwe people and Ojibwe reservations, so you you hear it. And it just like, it's like the, it's not even like the long formal or traditional greeting. So it's just kind of like something you throw out. So the idea that like something you just throw out actually has a really cool and lovely meaning is great. It does. But I wonder if there's a passive aggressive one that's like, I, hi, I, I see, but I do you not know, acknowledge You know, we could probably ask because we, I learned about that deeper meaning in a YouTube video made by the Sioux College in Ontario. So I bet I could email the professor and ask, and then we can come up with some like passive aggressive Ojibwe for next time. I would love that. Please do that. Cause I, I'm trying to like incorporate, I don't know. I, hopefully this isn't offensive, but I like the idea of incorporating a few like nice phrases from other languages. And I've always had this idea that different languages have the best version in way in, in which to communicate something. Like I like the German Ghana for you're welcome. Uh, and there's, I could think of tons of other examples and I, I'm, I'm really digging, like just thinking of hearing them. I really like this on name. So yeah, I would love to see if there's a, a passive aggressive way to say that I see, but do not Excellent. acknowledge. Well, there's been a light. big resurgence in indigenous language study. So if you are studying your native language or an indigenous language near you, we totally want to hear your favorite words and bonus points if you can give us some passive aggressive words because that's kind of how we roll. Those are the best ones, too. That's true. <laughs> Teach us how to be addicted, people, and so on that all the passive aggressive note, we end another episode of Travel Tomorrow. You can join us every two weeks for stories about what's new and what's next in travel. 
In our next episode, we'll bring you stories of people who skipped the traditional holiday celebrations and traveled instead. You can find us on all the social media goodness at Travel Tom Pod on Twitter, at Travel Tomorrow Pod on Facebook. We are Travel Tomorrow Pod at gmail.com, so you can send us your praise, your criticism if you have it, but really just your praise. And uh, we also want to say thanks to the Fiddle Revolt for the theme music. And remember to subscribe to Travel Tomorrow wherever you get your podcast. And hey, this is episode number six, so I think it's fair to say go ahead and, and rate and review us. Get us some stars, and that way other people can find the show. 